What is up everyone, Big Juicy Hog here, welcome back to the channel. So today we have another Shadowrun lore video for you. It's going to be the continuation of the timeline starting in 2029. So without further ado, let's get into it. Secession and War 2030 to 2037 The crash destabilized a large chunk of the world, which realigned itself with greater or lesser degrees of accompanying violence during most of the decade that followed. The U.S.-Canada merger went more smoothly than most. The crash had done so much economic damage to both countries that it made sense for them to combine, and the few protests went largely unheeded. On October 15, 2030, the remnants of the U.S. and Canada, minus the ceded NAN lands, of course, officially became the United Canadian and American States, or the UCAS. The only place where opponents of the Union got a respectful hearing was in California which held a referendum on session from the UCAS. The first of many, as it turned out. Before long, the secessionists got their wish, though not exactly in the way they likely hoped. It's one thing to leave under your own steam, quite another to be kicked out of your hoop. Plenty of UCASers were glad to see California go. By their book, it would always been too crazy to bother with. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Elsewhere in the world, Things didn't go so well. Awakened forces seized control of Siberia, much to the Ruskies' chagrin. Russia's western neighbors seemed to appreciate the move, however, and Belarus and Ukraine tried to secede in 2031. The Russians, who were getting their hoops kicked by Siberian magic and were starved for resources, figured they had to regain control of their western border and rolled in the troops. Inevitably, Poland got involved and when the Russians stepped on them, so did a lot of other countries. It all exploded in a conflict that would last for more than a dozen years. Predictably dubbed the Euro Wars. The hardcore fighting only lasted until 2033, however, when one of the weirdest incidents of the century nipped it in the bud. In the dead of night on January 23, 2033, Swedish airspace monitors detected several flights of what they took to be British Aerospace Night Wraith fighter bombers, streaking across the northern Europe. In short order, the aircraft obliterated key communications and command centers belonging to all sides. That same night, unknown assassins nailed more than a dozen key commanders. The combatants announced a ceasefire the following day. Neither the Brits nor anyone else ever claimed responsibility for the night wraith strike. In fact, every single government that night might plausibly have been involved made a point of publicly denying it. Who done it remains a mystery to this day. The America's turn came in 2034, when a force of awakened beings and metahumans led by three great dragons descended on the Amazon basin. After a short and bloody conflict, Brazilian forces ceded most of the Amazon basin to the invaders. Two days later, the newly declared nation of Amazonia, self-proclaimed savior of the ecosphere, claimed most of Brazil. They've been quiet down there since too quiet according to a lot of people who regularly post to the BBS. Turmoil also erupted north of the equator when Atslan resigned from the Sovereign Tribal Council to protest its members' constant eternal squabbling. That move made it no friends in the NAN which censured Atslan for its treatment of aboriginal peoples. Scenting an opportunity in this family quarrel, the Texas state legislature began agitating for a military venture to recover lands lost to Atslan. And then there were the Southerners. Lots of them had never forgotten the South's brief existence as a sovereign nation, and the 2030s gave diehard lovers of the old Confederacy a chance to resurrect it yet again. In 2033, led by senators from Alabama and Georgia, legislators from the Southern states staged a mass walkout that threatened to derail the ongoing merger of the United States and Canada. Delegates from 10 Southern states met to discuss secession, and though they ultimately decided against it, the seed had been sown. A year later, to protest what they saw as preferential treatment for the northern sprawl zones, these states broke away to form the Confederated American States, or the CAS. Everyone expected a second civil war to break out, but we got lucky. Despite emotions running high on both sides, most military units dealt with their divided loyalties by splitting up and moving to the country of their choice. 
Interestingly, the sovereign state of South Florida chose to join the recently formed Caribbean League rather than the CAS. And then came the Elven nations, Tir Nanog and Tir Tarangir, in Europe and North America respectively. Few other metahuman races have founded their own little country since, but the elves did it first and most thoroughly. Ask any dwarf or orc or troll how hard it is to get permission just to visit the two tiers. They'll talk for a week and still not be done describing all the official roadblocks. The elves of Ireland led the way, proclaiming the foundation of a new nation after the impeachment of Ireland's president over a vast corruption scandal. In an emotional Christmas Day broadcast in 2034, politician extraordinaire Seamus O'Kennedy announced the transformation of plain old Ireland into Tir Nanog, an elven nation steeped in the grace of magic, our Celtic heritage, our destiny in the sixth world, to quote the man himself. The Sinsorak elves, remember them, took their cue from the Irish cousins and announced the birth of Tir Tangier, the land of promise, in 2035. Simultaneously, they ceded from the Nan. After driving off Salishide troops, the leaders of Tir Tangier then settled down to the business of putting their elven paradise in order. They created the Council of Princes to run the place, with Lu Surehand as High Prince. Originally all elven, over the next two years, the Council admitted other metahumans as members, including the dragon Lofweir. Given that many elves trust dragons about as far as they can throw them, you've got to wonder just how many skeletons Lofwer threatened to yank out of those closets. But that's another story. The wave of secessions finally ended in 2037 when California became the California Free State in spite of itself. This particular comedy of errors began in 2036 when President McAllister kicked California out of the UCAS and withdrew all federal forces from the state in response to its latest secession threat. Tir Tangier lost no time mounting a surprise attack on Northern California, rolling all the way south of Redding with infantry and air support aided by paranimals, combat mages, and allegedly at least two dragons. The victorious Tyr army demanded that all non-elves leave the captured area within 30 days, to which the good citizens of Northern California said, Frag you. Guerrilla resistance sprang up like wildfire and soon forced the Tyr troops to pull back to Eureka. The land between Wairika and Redding remains a buffer zone claimed by both sides, but California's troubles weren't over yet. Simultaneously with the tier assault, Atslan stuck northward into the free state and captured San Diego. California's governor then made the supremely boneheaded move of appealing to the Japanese for military aid, hoping to shame the CAS and UCAS into sending troops. Japanese sent aid alright, in the form of Imperial Japanese Marines who took control of San Francisco to protect Japanese lives and corporate assets in the Bay Area. Council of Japanese Megacorps soon asserted themselves over the city, turning Greater San Fran into Tokyo by the Bay. Corporate Machinations 2033-2048 As the 30s rolled on into the 2040s, the megacorporate landscape gradually came to resemble the one we know and love today. The first of our current major players to bust onto the scene was Damian Knight, who made his debut with the famous nanosecond buyout of Ares Industries in 2033. Before the buyout, no one had ever heard of this guy. Afterwards, no one could stop talking about him. Mostly speculated on how he'd pulled off the feat. Using a series of expertly programmed computers in Stockholm, Sweden, Knight executed a series of transactions so complicated that only another computer could read them. By the end of the minute, it took for the whole deal to go down. Three corporations had ceased to exist. Two multimillionaires lost their fortunes. Three other people became multimillionaires. And Damian Knight had acquired 22% of Ares. That put him in the same league control-wise as CEO Leonard Aurelius. The two men loathed each other on sight, and the history of Ares for the past 27 years has been a laundry list of their attempts to somehow bring each other down. At around the same time, the company that would later become the North American branch of Fuchi Industrial Electronics acquired one of the major pieces of its future empire under decidedly mysterious circumstances. In May of 2034, a two-horse corp named Matrix Systems of Boston came out with the first gray market cyber terminal. 
Six weeks later, the company's main computer crashed and its two founders died in apparently unrelated accidents. Now, it just so happened that Richard Villiers, a corporate raider with a reputation for ruthlessness, had bought himself a 49% stake in the Matrix Systems the year before, and only settled for that because the company's founders wouldn't let him buy the whole thing outright. After their deaths, Billiard bought the company for pennies. One month after the computer crash, who but Richard Billiards would contact Fuji, then owned by a pair of Japanese partners with copies of the very Matrix Systems research data that was supposedly lost forever. The data enabled him to buy his way into Fuji, eventually becoming one of the corp's ruling triumvirate. Third on that list of corporate players to emerge was the great dragon Lothweir who in 2037 made the startling announcement that he owned 63% of the Seder Krupp stock, the backbone of the BMW corporate empire. Big Worm used it to vote himself into chairmanship of the board, then name himself president and CEO of BMW. He changed his name to Seder Krupp Corporation, and the rest, as they say, is history. The final player on the scorecard was Yamanetsu Corporation, which didn't manage to break into the Big 7 until 2041. This upstart, as some of the older corps persisted calling it, made determined efforts throughout that year to snag itself a seat on the corporate court and on the board of the Zurich Orbital Gemenschaft Bank. Despite fierce opposition, Yamanetsu had carved out its niche by 2042, turning the Big 7 into the Big 8. That is going to be it for today's video. Tune in next time for more Shadowrun lore as I continue on with the timeline. Thanks for watching.